Hello, welcome. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jackie Gales Webb, and this is HUR at Home Inspiration. Every Sunday at 6 p.m. for almost the past year, we've been having exciting guests to come on and talk to us about faith and how it plays a part in everything that we do. One of the things that I like about Facebook, and I know Facebook is for the old fogies now, but I still like it. One of the things, the features that it does, it sends you reminders, memories, uh, photos of one year ago, two years ago, seven years ago. Well, today, Facebook sent me a photo of one year ago, and it was of the Helping Hands Radiothon that we did last year at 96.3 WHUR to raise funds to send Howard University students across the country, across the globe, as a matter of fact, to do community service. Reverend Malik Thomas was my guest last Sunday, and he was a graduate of Howard University and the Alternative Spring Break program. And he talked about how special that program was, how much it meant to him, how much he learned and how much he gained from it in his ministry, which is a wonderful ministry. He's doing an excellent job. He also talked about what we must prepare to do after the pandemic. We need to be thinking now about what's going to happen when we get out of this. And we may never really get back to what was known as normal before. I don't really think so. Things have changed too much. When we think about all the people that we've lost, Patrick Ellis was in the photo that I took one year ago in the studios of WHUR, and he's now with the Lord. We've lost 500,000 people, and um, hopefully we won't lose much more, but there's so much that we need to be prepared for. There's so much we need to be trusting God for, and my guest today has always been forward thinking, has always been positive, has always given us hope, has always been a tremendous leader. She has been heard for several times on Rankin Chapel's broadcast here on the campus of Howard University in Washington, DC. She's a theologian, a faith leader, an entrepreneur, a presidential advisor, a former ambassador, an author, an activist. And I'd like to welcome to HUR at Home Inspiration, my friend, Reverend Susan Johnson Cook. How are you? It's so glad to be with you. Thank you for having me. Ambassador Cook, I am honored to have you with us for several reasons. One, because of your many accomplishments and your tremendous leadership, but also we're alums. Yeah. <laughs> we were in college. Mm -hmm. but before we get to you and all the great things that you've done and your remarkable history, I want to ask you about how you have made it through the pandemic. How has the pandemic affected you? And what do you see as our post-pandemic activity that we need to be thinking about? Well, thank you so much, Jackie, for having me. It is four decades plus, you know, that not only was there leadership between the two of us, but there's been friendship. And I just want to salute you and celebrate you for your consistent communicating of good news and the issues that matter. So thank you for your leadership and your courage of facing a world where women really weren't welcome in the beginning, but you made a way and you stuck with it and look at what God has done. So I've handled the pandemic, I believe extremely well. Um, I'm a mother of two adult sons. And when COVID hit, I was in Washington, DC. I had been in the Obama administration and stayed in the area. But when COVID hit, we all kind of went to our homestead. We had a beach house in Sag Harbor, historically African-American community. And we all ended up there. And then all the families we knew ended up there, all the generations under each household. We had space, we had each other, and it really was the village of Sag Harbor. And so to be quarantined in the summer in a beach town, which is my favorite place to be, and to be able to be outside, we were able to deal with 
a, a little more healthily than many people who had to be closeted and who really were locked on lockdown. We had space. We could go to the beach. We could go to our backyards. We could walk. And so it was a really um, important time because we had to find our strength to help those who were in crisis. And I found my ministry load certainly increasing, my counseling load increasing, because many people could not handle the mental stress of what that new normal was. Um, I also reflected back having been on the front lines of 9-11, uh, ground zero. And when you go, that was really the first trauma that I had ever experienced in my life. And when you are on the front lines of that, your mind does what it needs to do to kind of protect you. And so it kind of seems like it's dormant, but as soon as another pandemic all happens, kind of all of that triggers again. So what you have to do is kind of kind of talk to yourself and make sure that you're mentally and emotionally sound. Uh, just like when Katrina happened, I knew that I was like, I've been on the front lines. I have to kind of be mentally and emotionally sound because you know that the people who are going through it are experiencing such trauma. You cannot control your emotions because you've never been in this place before. So I found my counseling coaching load of not only people who had been coming to me as like parishioners or a clients, but people who were my colleagues were like, how do I handle this? Fortunately, I had led a course, an online course with a group of black ministers and we had to do Zoom the first time like six months before COVID happened. And you know, they were like, how do I do this? How? So by the time COVID hit, they were like Zoomologists. I call them Zoomologists now. And so we were prepared to teach a generation who had really never done virtual ministry or virtual meetings. And so I felt a little more ahead of the curve, even though we knew it was a very serious epidemic, we felt that we could help others who were just coming into this new way of life. So on the other side of it now, we're almost a year since it was announced. Um, I think we're looking at what will be a new normal. And I think it was very important what you said in your introductory remarks, because it's not going to be the normal any of us were used to. You can't go back you know, but it will be developing a new normalcy. And so I feel we're prepared emotionally and spiritually to walk forward. Yeah, I know it's going to be a while before I take that mask off, Ambassador ooh, Cook. <laughs> ooh, yeah, you know, or sit close to people or, you yeah. know, friends over. It's it's different. It's right. Different. They might say all clear, but you might still see Jackie in a mask. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Charles Keener is with us. Nikita Bell. Hello, Nikita. Eugene Johnson Jr. is with us. Vernestine Strickland is with us. Hello. And Vernestine's tuning in from Fort Washington. God bless you, Vernestine. Ambassador Cook, you have done so much in your life, but let's start from the beginning. You were raised in Bronx, New York. That's right. And your father was a businessman. Is that correct? Yeah, my parents were, you know, we've been celebrating Black History Month and certainly tomorrow, you know, begins Women's History Month. And I reflected back, you know, we certainly have legendary icons that we all liked, um, you know, and we can call the role Dorothy Hyatt and Mary McLeod Bethune and other men and Earl Graves. But I also stand on the shoulders of parents who were legendary, who really created a business well before many black families were creating businesses. It started in our basement when I was five years old. So now I'm a third generation business owner and we celebrate Madam CJ Walker, but I had Dorothy CJ Johnson, my mother, who was the first black woman millionaire that I knew. And my parents built such a strong um, business that is now still the longest running family owned business in New York City. Um, and so it's 59 years old. And I count myself so fortunate because I understand now the value of having the financial independence so that we could go to college without student loans. And, you know, we used to bring our parents up to productions at Emerson College and we had our parents involved in our lives. So I just realized I'm such the beneficiary of just greatness. And I just thank my God for my parents having the vision because they started as sharecroppers in the deep South mm. um, in the 1930s and 40s. And, but they knew that that wasn't their destiny. So they made it through that black migration north to New York City, met on their first day in New York City. And so they were civil servants by day and built this business by night. So they were hard workers, but they were partners. So I saw a love story 
I saw a partnership. I saw a family that was prioritized. And so I grew up healthy and I just realized how blessed I was to have that. And I'm trying to create that for my generations who follow me. So we're talking about generational wealth so that each generation doesn't have to try to start again, but that we could build upon that. And so I'm trying to do that, not just for my family, but other families. Wow. Hello to Cynthia Stanton Jones from Northport, Alabama. She's watching us in, in uh-huh. Northport, Alabama. And you mentioned your parents kept coming up from the South from in, during the Great Migration. And my parents did the same yes. uh, from Georgia. Mm. And I, was, I remembered as I watched Andra Day portray Billie Holiday, I remember them telling me, uh, well, they didn't tell me because I was a child, but I heard them talking about how they would go into Harlem. They went, they they loved hearing Billie Holiday's recordings. Yes. And they went into one of the spots in Harlem yes. to see her and they were so disappointed because she was so high, mm. so high. But I, but I tell you this, the Andrew Day, have you seen it? The, I on- have. And, you know, Andrew Day is now one of my new Delta sorrows. We're both honorary members of Delta. So, of course, we had to watch it. But, it, I mean, it's amazing. And not only did our parents go to these spots where these artists were, you know, they took us to the Apollo Theater. I remember standing in line for, like, a day, it almost seemed, for James Brown, you know, when he was on the Apollo stage. And there used to be a a Tad Steakhouse right next to the Apollo. So people will eat their steak and then get, by that time their family would have caught up in line to get their tickets. But it was such a rich, rich, loving time. And then my parents would take us to the Savoy Manor, which was a ballroom. And it was intergenerational parties. I remember they would have church dances. So around the table would be my parents and their, their friends and our pastor. And so I learned kind of clean fun I learned how a man should treat a woman. I learned how, you know, you could be, have really good social life and still be a Christian. It wasn't one or the other. So I grew up with this balance and you know, we had a great balance at Emerson College, you know, Uh, we did it all and we came out clean and we tried to have a great life. And that's really what I think is so important. Have a balanced life, have a clean life, and you can still have fun and faith and fame and family, all of the above. Amen. Amen. Carolyn A. McKinney Culver is called is here from Waldorf and D. Walker says, wow, that's black greatness. Wow. I remember my, my mother used to bring me in because I grew up in Long Island. Yes. Bring me into the Radio City Music Hall every Easter for, to see the Rockets. <laughs> that's right. We used to have the little gloves on and the patent of the shoes. That's right. Easter sunrise was like five in the morning. <laughs> they would have service at Radio City, but we did it all. It was so Oh, wonderful. Right. So wonderful. Now, yeah. you went to an HBCU before you met me at Emerson College in Boston. You went to Fisk, right? Fisk University. I got to give a shout out. I just had lunch with my girlfriend, Linda Martin Stewart, uh, who was at Fisk. And I was the class of 77. And it was so amazing because I didn't finish there. I came back north like you said, after my freshman year, because my dad was very sick. And so I ended up at Emerson, which I loved as well. But I went back to um, Fisk with my classmates on the 40th anniversary because I was the speaker for the baccalaureate service. And it was almost as though I never missed a beat. We remembered the dorm and we had pictures. And so some of my best friends are HBCU grads as well as the Emerson family. So I just feel like I am so beloved because I had really the benefit of both and Howard University. I did some graduate work at Howard. So I think the HBCU experience is so awesome, but certainly Emerson was so much fun too. We did it all, which was great. Yes, yes, I see uh, Cynthia Stanton-Jones says she's excited to listen to my honorary Sora of Delta. Hey, Sora. H-U-R. And Kenyon McAfee, good evening, my sisters. So good to see you. Black history is alive and well, present and future. Past, present, and future. Team McAfee, that's Kenyon and Cheryl. Thank you Uh, for joining us, yeah. We were both, Ambassador Cook, we were both Northerners. We're actually Northern African-Americans. And we met at Emerson College in Boston. And I will always remember meeting my good friends at Emerson who were African-Americans from Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. who never knew what it felt like to be the only Black people in the room most of the time. It was right. a, 
was a different mindset. Did you find that? Oh, very much so, because then it was really called Chocolate City. And, you know, it was about 80 percent African-American in D.C. So for us, it was quite the opposite. Usually it was one tenth of the student population would be black. And then we had to deal with the other 90%. But we also grew up doing a, the black power era. I remember being in seventh grade in an all white, predominantly private school. And it was, you know, upper, upper middle class. And they allowed us to have black history day. And then they had let us have black history week. And we were bringing every black performer, every black person we knew to that campus. And and we introduced African dance at the time. And, you know, but as Stephanie Mills came, um, she was, had, was before Broadway, but it was like, we had to introduce our culture to them because they had no clue of what our culture was and what a different world it is now um, where we are really leading front and center. And it is a time for us to really pronounce and celebrate our diversity and who we are as black women, as black people. And so I'm excited about that. I just created the Global Black Women's Chamber of Commerce. And I'm also running a program called the uh, Black Women in Ministry, the Real Black Women in Ministry, because this is also legacy time. You know, this is our fifth decade of working, you know, and leading people. And I wanted to make sure that I left an opening so that we don't have to keep trail blazing, but that we can start paving the trails that have been blazed so people can walk on them. And so with Black Women in Ministry, it's, it's a program that was funded by the Lilly Endowment for us to be able to find 25 Black women senior pastors who would mentor 25 other women who want to come into parish ministry. So they get the benefit of a staff person who's paid for by this grant, but they also get to pour into the life of a woman who hopefully will not end the trail there, but that we will have generations who follow. So it's wonderful for that. And with the Black Women's Chamber of Commerce, it is the first chamber for, for Black women who are business owners around the globe. And so we're a hundred strong now in six months, and we really are birthing. We were born in COVID, we were birthed in COVID, but we're birthing new possibilities because we have to think about what life is going to be like six months from now, a year from now. It won't be the same. You have to do business differently. You have to do business differently now. And so the world uses the term pivot, but it's really, what are you going to do on the other side of this? It's not just pivot, but it's also prepare. So if you take the word pivot, it's about um, preparing. It's about being international. It's about being vocational, providing vocations for folks. It's about opportunities. And it's about having your work tight. That's what pivot really means. You got to have a tight strategic plan to go forward. Now, now the, the first thing that you talked about, the 25 women that will be mentored, how will you find these women? What is the procedure? There might be some people who are watching now who might be interested. Well, this first round has already been selected. Um, the 25 women, are we were already in place about four months down the road. But what it will do is that we are, number one, giving visibility to new voices, because sometimes you don't know the voices of those women who are leading our parishes, both rurally and in, in urban settings. But it also will give an opportunity for these mentees who were also selected by their mentor to serve. So we're going to be keeping journals. We're going to be keeping um, data so that there can hopefully be another round of this wonderful, wonderful effort. It's a program actually that was revisited. I was in the program three decades ago mm. when women in ministry, black women in ministry were so new to the fold. And so I've realized that now that seminaries are graduating more than 50% black women, we have to also be intentional, almost like affirmative action for black women in ministry. Because if you're not in the in the in the queue, you know, if you're not in the queue and you don't have someone mentoring you or opening a door for you, then how do you ever get in? So you find these women who will have their masters of divinity or their PhDs or their demons, and they sit in the pews and they wait perhaps for an opportunity to read the scripture or maybe wait for an opportunity to be called on to be worship leader, but their ministries actually begin to fade because they really haven't been used. So what we're trying to do is create resources, opportunities, and networking so that no one feels alone 
They see the possibilities because their mentors become the ones that introduce them to the presiding elders and to the bishops if you're in a connectional church. Their mentors are the one who let you know if you're in the Baptist church, there's an opportunity here. I'm not just gonna put you out there to be a candidate, but I'm going to help you navigate so that you can really be a candidate that's viable and be selected. So it's about what we've learned, the lessons we've learned that we can help you with and the mistakes we've had that you won't have to repeat because you have a generation who's preceded you. And I think that's really what legacy is. It's planting seeds that we may not ever see grow, but while we have the opportunity to water these seeds, that's what we're doing with this ministry. Maggie Wise Matthew says, this is an awesome idea and I'm excited about this. And so am I, Meg, uh, uh, Margie, Margie. Um, Ambassador Cook, you were the first female senior pastor in the 200 year history of the American Baptist Churches of USA. Um, mm -hmm. What did you face being the first? Well, well, you know what? Because we had been raised in this, I mean, I, we went to, my, my family was Christian and I went to church every Sunday, as you know, even through Emerson, but I did not know that there was oppression or sexism. I felt like anything, you know, we left Emerson saying anything we think we want to do, we're going to be able to do, whether that's Broadway, Hollywood. And so I was, was raised in a family that was like, yes, you can, you know, just like President Obama, yes, you can, whatever you want, go for it. So when I, when I arrived at, um, Marinus Temple Baptist Church, and I want to give a shout out. Uh, you know, it was 180 years old. Uh, they had been a mission church, which meant the denomination had supported them all these years. They were sharing the building with a Chinese church, and it was down in Chinatown, New York City, which means away from the black communities. And it was a church that no man wanted to candidate for. So they thought it really was going to die. They were like, we'll, we'll, we'll let the woman go and try to candidate there. So they thought he was going to die. And then all of the skills we learned at Emerson, all the political skills, my brother had been in politics. We did the door to door. We did subway stops, passing out flyers. And all of a sudden in the first six months, it was 150 members from 12. And then in the next 12 months, it was like 500 members. And so all of a sudden it caught the sexists off guard because they were like, we can't say that God's not using her. We can't say that nothing's happening there. So there was a new respect level. And then people like Dr. Gardner C. Taylor, the late Dr. Gardner C. Taylor, and men who were respected, W.W. Franklin Richards, and my late pastor, Dr. Ollie Wells, Dr. Wyatt T. Walker, all put their arms around me as their little sister and as their spiritual daughter in ministry. And when they stood with me, it, it was saying to the other guys, leave her alone. And so it was a new level of respect that happened. And the second thing that happened was we had this lunch hour service on Wednesdays at lunchtime, which a thousand people would come to from the city agencies, from the corporate America, from the police department. And they would crowd into this church on Wednesday in the middle of what they would call nowhere. And people were like, wow. So we started getting media attention. You know, you, my friends on the radio and the New York Times and the New York Daily News. And suddenly we were headlined a headline story and we were able to put mariners on the map and from that experience um we were able to bless the lives of a lot of women in ministry i had at one time seven women on my staff uh, we were able to bless the lives of families who who never had anyone pour into them positive messages you know they had lived in public housing and most people said you know, you're just going to be that way the rest of your life. And I was like, oh, no, we're not. We're going to have another gener first generation of college students. And we went and got scholarships from Benedict College. Oh, no, we're not. We're going to take a trip to Virginia. We're getting on the buses. How many can pay $32? Okay, we're going to go to Virginia. And it was to begin to expose and expand their world until Marinus Temple was a viable ministry. And I believe that God gives us all of that we have, not just to see how many people we know, but how many lives we touch. Yes, yes. And, you know, while I was celebrating all that, the next thing I knew you were at the White House. Yeah. Oh, the White House. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And that came, you know, all of those first blessings came from being in the pulpit of Mariners Temple Baptist Church. So a couple of things happened. One is that the at lunchtime, that service I described, the brass, what they call the police brass, who were a block away from police headquarters, would worship with us on lunchtime. I didn't know there were police chaplains in the city of New York. So the women, black, white, and others said, 
to the chap uh, to the police commissioner who at that time was Benjamin Ward, the first black um, commissioner. There's a woman up here who's our pastor during the week, make her chaplain. They made me chaplain for the city of New York, a position to which I had for 21 years, the first female chaplain. And from that position, I applied for a White House fellowship. And the White House fellowship is for young leaders. And if you're listening to me and you're between like 25 and 35, and you have some leadership, but you wanna be expanded, it was designed by Lyndon Baines Johnson, President Johnson, some 60 years ago, nonpartisan, for young leaders to have an experience at the executive level of government. Very competitive, you just go to whitehouse.gov and you can get the application. It's about a year long process, but out of 2000 people, they select about 14. If you are selected, you're guaranteed to work with the president of the United States, the vice president, or one of the cabinet secretaries, guaranteed. I ended up working with President Clinton. It was the last, uh, it was the first term, but the last two years of his first term. He was very involved in the black church. And so he asked me many times either to help write speeches for him, to give him protocol if he was going to a conference where there were black leaders or to represent him as the president of the United States at these conferences. So here I am my second week on the job and I'm representing the president of the United States, which was unfathomable. At the same time, he made the next police commissioner who fought, who actually was the one who appointed me, his name was Lee P. Brown. He made, President Clinton made him the first drug czar of America. So he comes to the White House at the same time my White House fellowship begins. I'm invited to the cabinet meeting and Lee Brown says, hey, how you doing? And the president says, you know her? He's like, that was my chaplain. The president said, well, she's going to be my chaplain. And so I now have a relationship with the president of the United States, my former police commissioner. And it just kind of added you know, on from there. And the Lord gave me what was supposed to be a one-year fellowship because of President Clinton. I was able to stay at the White House seven years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just he just opened up so many doors for me. So I want to thank him um, and Secretary Clinton because you really made such a difference in my life. And they taught me how to navigate these new orders. Nobody's born a preacher. Nobody's born a politician. You need someone who shepherds you, mentors you, protects you, and teaches you. And they did that. And so I just, I'm very, very thankful. And if you're a friend of Ambassador Susan Cook, you got to learn to keep up. After, while all that was going on, I looked up, she was ambassador. How did you get to be ambassador? <laughs> well, it's relationships, relationships, relationships. Because what I also want to say is while all that was going on is Jackie Gales Webb was giving us the opportunity to have voice. What good is all you do if nobody knows what you're doing? And so I want to thank you publicly because there was never a show that you had, that you hosted. There was never an opportunity that you had that you did not have me on and all of many of people who were accomplished. So thank you because we need the voice. We need the platform and we need many platforms. So that's really important. Relationships, relationships, relationships. When you have a platform, people know what your skill set is, who you are. You have familiarity. They know that you are somehow connected with the president of the United States. You keep your resume and your CV fresh and you keep your relationship with your local and national elected leadership because they are important. They have the ear of the president. They have the ear of the Congress. And all of those relationships were kept fresh. My late brother had been an assemblyman in New York State. He was the first black assemblyman of the Bronx. So people like Chuck Schumer and Charles Rangel were in the assembly with him. They used to ride up and down from Albany together. So I met them in that relationship. Who would have known that Chuck Schumer would now be the senior majority leader of the United States Congress? So all of those kinds of relationships, if you keep them fresh and you don't burn your bridges, no matter what it looks like, do not burn your bridges. Send your thank you notes. Thank people when they do something which you think might be small, but they appreciate it. And then when Secretary Clinton gets to the White House, it's the Obama administration. They're like, we know your faith experience. We know your political experience. But do you have any international experience? And I had just made a list of all the places I had gone as a pastor and led delegations, the places I had lived in high school in Spain and in Switzerland. And I had this list of like 20 countries. And I said, yeah, I have some international experience. Lived in Africa right after Emerson. And so they said, send that list to us. We have this position that's U.S. Ambassador for International Religious Freedom. And it seems like your resume might fit the bill. 
sent it to them. It ends up on the secretary's desk. And then I had to go through two Senate confirmation hearings. Now, here's a very important point, because it was the most conservative position in the U.S. government. It had been really written in 1998 for a conservative to hold that seat. I didn't represent that bill. And so my two Senate confirmation hearings, the first was I was wonderful in terms of information and content, but there were politics that were being played behind the scenes because I was black, I was not conservative, and President Obama was black, and I was his pick. And so when you have all of those dynamics, you need someone from the other side who's going to help you navigate those waters. Otherwise, you don't get in. The Lord, say the Lord, sent me a, an evangelical pastor, uh, Reverend Rob Shank, who became my best friend and said, I felt your heart as a Christian and I want to help you to have a second hearing and I want to help you because I believe God wants you to have this seat. And so partnerships don't always come looking like us. They don't, they're not always female. They're not always black. They're not always young. You be open to the move of God and those who God sends your way. And he's now my one of my best friends in Washington, but he knew the people on the other side of the aisle who I did not know. And they sat with me and I sat with them. And at the end of the ambassadorship, they said, you know, we gotta admit you were pretty good. <laughs> you were like really the best ambassador we've ever had. But this was this black Baptist pastor from the Bronx coming into this new world and this new order that I didn't even know. So you have to be willing to learn. You have to be humble enough to say, I really got to get somebody to tutor me and school me and, and, and to accept that and not be big headed. But when you get to the position, do the best you can. I wanted to make sure that every day I went in, President Obama did not have to worry about this part of government, that it was going to be tight, I was going to give it not only 100%, but everything I could give it so that when they spoke about this department, the International Religious Freedom Department, they could say nothing, but they're on it. It's tight. It's right. She's doing it. They're doing it. And I think that's what we have to do. When we get in places, do the best you can. Give it your best shot. And those will be the things people remember. You know, you pointed out something so important, especially in 2021, that we need to be able to work with people who have different views from us. You talked about uh, the gentleman who was actually an angel that mm -hmm. came from a very conservative point of view, but yet saw your, you know, your faith and, and understood that you would contribute to this country in a very meaningful way. And I hope and I'm praying that we can get to a point where we're not so divided, that we right. can still have different viewpoints, but still work together toward a common goal of making yes. this country a wonderful place, that, the place that it should be. Yes. And, yes. and um, you continue to work to do uh, that, just that. And, and one of the things that you're doing is um, the virtual summit that's coming up. Martin Black Black Woman. Woman. Yes, thank yeah. you. So, yeah, so yeah. talk again about that and let the audience know how maybe they can participate. Oh, thank you so much for that. Um, and hopefully Reverend Shank and I will go on tour talking about how we walk together as one, black and white, male and female, conservative, liberal, because it's not political. This is, this is a thing that's theological now. We have to not be the divided states of America. We have to be the United States. And so if we can be that model. God use us. So the state of black women, state of black women, plural, dot org is where you can register for free complimentary. It is a virtual summit that brings together black women in business who are leaders around the world, leaders in the military, leaders in money matters, leaders in marketing. And we will bring the best and look at the not only the successes, but what are the challenges we face as a people? Used to be the state of Black America, but we have zeroed in on state of Black women business owners because we have been the fastest growing sector in America. We really have been the economic backbone of America. But usually when people are looking at pools of money or looking at ways to help, they usually kind of look at this whole pool. Well, we want people to look in on Black women who are business owners who are doing it. We have uh, minors in South Africa who are Black women. We have women in the media, like Jackie Gales Webb is going to be one of our guests. We have Black women doing it at every level, 
Black women mayors, Mayor Muriel Bowser is going to be one of our guests. Ha the business of running a city. You know, she had to run the city in the midst of an insurrection. She had to run the city in the midst of elections. She had to run the city in the midst of Black Lives Matter. What is the business of running a city? So we're going to get into the head and have a conversation. And you will also be able to have Q&A and have conversation as well. It's stateofblackwomen.org. Friday, March 19th, from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You are welcome, women from all over the world, and men also welcome to hear what's happening with sisters who are in business. So we'd be delighted to have you. And sponsorship is always available, too. Yeah, that's right. That's stateofthewoman.org. This has been a, a remarkable conversation. And, you know, I am, of course, very proud of all of the distinguished graduates from Howard University yeah. working at WHUR for all of these years, but I am also very proud of all the distinguished alums I have from Emerson College, the small college in Boston. Yeah. Uh, you are one of them. We, we uh, Susan Banks at uh, mm -hmm. TV One and, yes. and all of these different people in media, behind the scenes and business people. We had a really, really remarkable group of African American people to come through this oh, small really? college in Boston, Massachusetts. We did. And I have to give a shout out to both because I'm an Emerson graduate and I'm a Howard University Business School Executive Business graduate. So thank you, Howard, for letting me be on your campus. It was wonderful, Kim Wells and, and the dean, all of those who made it possible for to have for us to have executive education because that was really kind of the genesis for starting this Chamber of Commerce. You need to understand the business side of church business. You need to know the business side of everything that we're doing of me media so that you know your numbers, you know that you're making your budget, you know what else you need to do to make your budget. All of those things are really important. And so I'm excited about this season and I thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. Oh, yep. Howard University is the place to be. Yes. Ambassador Cook, please give us a closing prayer for this wonderful conversation. And, and thank you to everyone who joined us. I see uh, D Walker talks yeah. about partnerships, relationships, mentorships, amen. And amen. Cynthia Stanton-Jones says an awesome program. Ambassador Cook, please give us a prayer. All right, and thank you for all from Sunday with Sue J. Thank you in the USA for joining us. God bless you, God. We thank you for Jackie. We thank you for this station. We thank you, God, for all the listeners. We thank you for everyone who will be touched and blessed by this interview. We thank you, God, for just being a blessing in our lives. Now, God, it's Black History every day with us, and we celebrate who we are, but we celebrate whose we are. So bless us, the work that you've given our hands and hearts and mouths to do, and we will be sure to give your name all the glory the honor and the prayer. Bless all those who've lost loved ones during COVID and bless all of those who must carry on during and after COVID. We give your name the glory. It's in the name of Jesus we pray that all who believe say amen and shout hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Ambassador Susan Thank Cook. Thank <laughs> you. I love you, Jackie Gale. Love you yeah. too. All and right. I love you all too. Thank you so much for, for joining us on HUR at home inspiration. And, and before we go, I wanna shout out to Vicki Saunders, WHUR's director of multicast for making the following situation possible. Starting Saturday, March 6th, listeners will to HUR Voices on Sirius XM channel 141 will be able to hear the 25th anniversary edition of Black Radio Telling It Like It Was. It's a radio series. It was uh, award-winning, Peabody award-winning, and it was Produced by yours truly, Jackie Gales Webb, and Howard University Sonia Williams, and independent producer Lex Gillespie for the Smithsonian. And Lou Rawls was the host. Wait till you hear his voice. The series chronicles African American contributions to radio, and it includes the history of WHUR, Patrick Ellis, and The Quiet Storm with Melvin Lindsay. And you can hear the six episodes on HUR Voices, Sirius, Sirius XM Channel 141, Saturdays at 5 p.m., starting on March 6th. Thank you so much. Please join me next Sunday. We have uh, gospel artist Darwin Hobbs and gospel, um, well, I don't know how to classify her because she's done so much for the gospel industry, the one and only Teresa Harrison will join us next Sunday on HUR at Home Inspiration.
God bless you. You be safe.